Valley, but welcome to California. If I could, if I could ask our first three speakers to come and join me, I think we were going to do it individually, but as you can see, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge getting up and down. So if our first three speakers uh, could come up, that would be fantastic. Dr. Lee Alexander, Mr. John Eric Hagen, and Mr. Mike Salosi. Um, and while they're doing that, let me just take a moment here to um, and um, I can see one of the reasons they wanted people up individually is because of the way the table set in front of the screen. So if we have to, we'll pull aside, but I think it will be more efficient um, to have them come up um, one at a time. And then after the first three have spoken, we'll take questions. And then there's a break in between, a very short break. We appreciate if you'll um, make it a short break and we get to the uh, remaining speakers. So good morning and, and thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, if you don't know, I'm your diversity officer here to have a conversation with the five of you guys. And that meant, means that um, I was really pleased at breakfast to see lots of women and then found out they all just left to go on. Um, so for a few women in the audience, you know, rock and roll, thank you for sticking around. I'm glad you're here. Um, diversity in U.S. Maritime, but what the heck. Uh, I just gave a speech um, the week before last Maritime Administration asked me to speak um, for women's and It kind of cracked me up because they wanted me to speak about um, being a person of character and, and uh, being a trailblazer, and I wasn't sure what that really meant, frankly. A trailblazer. I mean, you know how it is, guys. You, you get up in the morning, you do your job, next thing you know, 30 years has gone by. Um, and so you don't really think of yourself as a trailblazer. It's really sad that they they propped me up and I'm supposed to you know, give everybody a pep talk about how wonderful it is to be a woman in the business. And obviously I didn't have trouble finding dates as I was younger. Um, uh, it was, uh, the odds were in my favor. Oh, that's, that's a little funny. Um, um, but um, I, I hearken back to um, old Walter B. Jones Sr. Does anybody remember Congressman Walter B. Jones Sr.? <laughs> okay, well, I'm not too young, and I did work on the House Merchant Rate and Fisheries Committee, and he was the chairman, and I, I posted his picture up um, in, um, that he used from when he started in Congress in 1966 until the day he died in Congress in 1992. And uh, I don't know if they put a picture of me in here, but uh, my picture in here is from about eight years ago, and that's my thing. I'm going to use that picture till the day I die. Um, so Walter B. Jones is, is the guy we look to, and, and the business has changed even dramatically since they eliminated it. I do think it's sad that it's gone, because frankly, um, you know, in, in the U.S. federal government, maritime transportation is all over the place. Um, and I've spoken to you guys before about this, uh, and it's nice to be with friends again. But, you know, uh, I've always said that if you, if someone who didn't really understand the U.S. government, or even someone who, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not a U.S. citizen, because lots of uh, Americans don't really understand their own federal government and how it really truly operates. But if someone were to ask you something about maritime transportation in the U.S., my well, what's the question? Because what your question is is where I would direct you. If you wanted to know about um, updating charts and maps in the Arctic, I would direct you to NOAA under the Department of Commerce. And if you wanted to know about um, regulation of the waterways, I would direct you to U.S. Coast Guard under the Department of Homeland Security. And if you wanted to know about upgrade of the locks and dams on the system, I would direct you to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the Department of Defense. And if you wanted to know about sealift capacity, I would direct you to the Maritime Administration in the Department of Transportation and to U.S. Trans DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff base in St. Louis. And that's just a, a brief, because we could go on about the Federal Maritime Commission um, and Fish and Wildlife Service, Alice Water Interests, and, um, and NTSB, uh, and, uh, Mineral and the Marine Mammals Commission, who's just become a member of the Committee on the Marine Transportation System. So um, there's a correlation here between trying to address just maritime transportation and honing that down to something like e-navigation. And today Mike Salosi is going to talk a little bit about 
uh, the Coast Guard is co-leading an effort to address how we focus that um, in a way. And even within Coast Guard, there's different pieces of that. And even within DOD, there's different pieces of it and no other pieces of it. So it's, it's challenging for us in federal government. We can appreciate how challenging it is for those of you working with the federal government. But um, what I want to emphasize to you, if you haven't heard about the CMTS, the Committee on the Marine Transportation System, go to our website at www.cmts.gov. We have lots of different information in there and involved in is infrastructure investment. That's a really hot topic now in every government um, because money isn't so um, uh, just available to invest in every single thing that we invest in our national transportation systems. And the same goes for our maritime transportation systems. Um, but what we're trying to do in the CMTS, and I want to impart this upon you, because when you go to Washington, D.C., you need to remind people under this really big conversation out of the White House about infrastructure investment, that infrastructure investment also means informational infrastructure. Okay? Because people often talk concrete. What does it mean? Or dredging. What is our infrastructure? And that's fantastic. Um, uh, but what is the informational side of that? going to accelerate the efficiency and use of our system in the absence of all the money to invest in our infrastructure. So I'm encouraging you to remind folks, federal government, the White House, and members of Congress, for those that do uh, go to Capitol, informational infrastructure is just as valuable and more valuable than the conversation about bricks and mortar. So I have just a couple of asks today as a moderator. I do a lot of facilitation uh, in my business. And one of the things I'm just going to say, I think you know it, but in the conversations and questions and answers, I think we'll all agree we're going to be polite. We're going to be positive. Um, we're going to, I'd really like you to think about being solutions oriented in your conversation rather than just talk about the problems. They're certainly valuable, but only um, and the fact that we're going to talk about solutions today. Um, we're in an academic setting, a setting, and I think that should really push us to think about um, not just the problems, but how we're going to get from here to there, and what is that future of navigation. So this is more than just a collection of papers and presentations. You have to help us, and we're going to help set the stage for talking about those next steps. Okay. So does anybody not agree that we're here to be polite and forward thinking and proactive and solutions oriented? All right, rock and roll. So um, our first speaker today uh, is Dr. Lee Alexander. And Dr. Alexander has been very, has been an active expert uh, in the area of e-navigation for quite a while. I know you're familiar with his work uh, and his ability Expertise, expertise with us. So for those of you who don't understand um, every aspect of e-navigation and what it means, because what does that term mean? It just doesn't mean navigation. It doesn't just mean how you use your access. It's broader than that. So as a start today, Dr. Alexander will provide the foundation for our morning. I am from New Hampshire. Our weather is the same as here in California, only 40 degrees colder. Okay, so we have some snow on the ground and trees and the leaves, but uh, it's the same thing, only different. My task is to explain in 20 minutes what is e-navigation, why it's important, how it should work. Uh, there will be a lot of information that will be provided. Uh, 
key components. So they all work. Uh, in 20 minutes, it'll be difficult to do all of that, but certainly it's an introduction to the role and responsibility of government agencies in terms of both the challenges and the uh, opportunities, as Helen pointed out, but also looking at as well as the difference between those who provide information or services and those that will actually use them. And I will end with a user perspective and, and uh, uh, an urging greater involvement. This is the definition of e-navigation. Things to focus on, of course, is harmonized collection, integration, exchange, and presentation of information. And the E does stand for something. It's not say it's electronic and enhanced, or enhanced through electronic means. We have e-commerce, mails, e-banking. This is electronic enhanced navigation. These are the three main significant outcome and benefits that I first identified. Uh, my expertise has to do with shipboard navigation systems during the presentation. In particular, a better integration of better supporting information, better or more uh, intuitive user interface, and uh, ways to manage guard zones or information and I will use some examples of electronic navigational charts as well as actives. The goal of this, of course, is to do all of these things while actively engaging the mariner in the process of navigation while preventing human error. So it's not to overwhelm the mariner, but what you need, when you need it, and what it's needed for. I'm often asked, well, what are the e-navigation systems? Well, you can basically break it down into three components, equipment systems and services. I'm not going to go through all of these, but ECTUS is mostly con considered to be equipment. But yet it stands for Electronic Chart Display and Information System. It really is a system. Same is true for GPS, which is a part of the uh, GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. So to be overly concerned about what is equipment system or services, Perhaps a better way to look at it is that all three need to be considered more under the concept of e-navigation, if in fact they're going to be harmonized. I always like to look at things in terms of threes, and there's something I like to call the three where's. Where do we start from? Where are we at? And where do we go from here? First and foremost, as a former mariner, now retired, IMO decided way back in 2008 that e-navigation should be user-driven. And in this particular project, it was back in 2008, 2009, that Canada and Germany joined together to perform on behalf of IMO a worldwide user needs study. The different aspects of what e-navigation was to become, communications, reporting requirements, human machine interface, Information presentation, technical and operational enhancements, like redundancy, redundancy needed for, for GNSS. Interestingly, some of the results pointed out the type of things that we should be focusing on. Now, I'm not going to go through the user needs survey, other than to point out if there's going to be a redundancy or backup for GNSS. Loran C was not highly regarded. Ironically, it's been discontinued in North America, but the Europeans, particularly the British Isles, are quite interested in so-called e Loran. On the other hand, mariners are very comfortable with radar positioning and see this as another chance to enhance radar positioning as a component of e navigation. So then these user needs and priorities that were identified became then the primary areas of further investigation, both shipping shore-based, and search and rescue. Now again, I'm primarily going to focus on the shipboard rather than the shore-based, but there are human machine interface as well as operational issues. My hope is that in the next two days, most of these will be addressed at one time or another by the various leaders. And in particular, how these will be addressed in terms of the key elements for e-navigation that were in fact based upon the user needs. Architecture, human element, position fixing ENCs, equipment, all of these under a so-called technical framework 
because if it needs to be developed, and process description, data structures, information systems, all of this then needs to be based on an overarching architecture that includes a common maritime data structure. And in particular, it will be based on the IHO S100 Geospatial Information Standard. It will be the, the framework for a, a variety of the services that will be, that'll be provided. Now, overarching architecture, well, depends on whether or not you are a mariner or an architecture. There it is. I'm going to ask all of you to commit this to memory. There will be a quiz at the end of this presentation, and if you fail, you will have to see it again. Of course, I'm not being serious. Basic components are the shipboard on the left and the shore based on the right, all based on a common technical framework. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but a lot of work went into this. Okay? And the first thing that some of us would look at this is how in the hell is this going to ever be implemented? Well, one way to do it is to look at what are the requirements and what are the current capability and then to determine what are the gaps. And if you look where it says determine the space between where we are and where we want to be, that's the second and third of the where's. Where are we at? Where are we, going? Where are we now? And where are we going? So this then was a way to identify what are or should be the e-navigation solutions. And this was completed in 2012, much to the credit of an extremely capable person from South Korea, Mr. Shim Sung. And this is a very detailed, rather complex looking gap analysis, but very useful in a variety of ways because it identified what could be the potential solutions. And as Helen said, we need to look at solutions. And in fact, IMO has refined these solutions and prioritized them even more at that 59, that was last year, I believe. And if you look at solution one, two, and three, and four, for the most part, these all have to do with shipboard size of things, which I'll give some examples in a second. Now, there are ongoing activities by IMO. John uh, Eric Hagen, the next speaker, will uh, address some of these. Certainly, the strategy implementation plan will be a major focus, a major effort, I believe, over the next few years. Uh, John Eric will explain in further detail. There'll be other explanations. I know, for instance, Daniel Breton from Canada will explain what Canada is already doing in terms of maritime service portfolios. And there'll be others that are included in the strategy implementation plan in particular by various international organizations, member states, regional bodies, and ideally by the maritime industry. And there'll be three phases. If you look at the time frames there, model development over the next two years, starting next year, standardization for a couple more years, and implementation in 2019. I still expect to be alive by then, but this is, this is a long, ongoing process. Now, I mentioned I would look at some shipboard information tasks as well as information needs. The ones in green, the first four, these are all ECTUS related. And most of us that started out in e-navigation some 20, 25 years ago were primarily focused on this new type of navigation system. That's the good news, that ECTUS has already been identified as one of the existing components and potential building blocks along with the chart database and so-called ENCs. But there's a downside. ECTUS as mandatory carriage for solar vessels started in 2012. It will not be completed until 2018. So the likelihood that ECTUS can be adapted or modified or enhanced to meet e-navigation objectives during this time probably will not occur. On the other hand, the implementation won't be completed until 2018, so maybe these are hand in hand. There are also some other challenges with ECTUS. Um, there are a lot of various varieties of ECTUS systems, some type approved, some not, many being operated in the ECS mode of operation. There's still considerable uncertainty about the type of chart data that should be used, as well as the realization that the, that the minimum performance standard actually ended up limiting any new or increased functionality. 
And I'll give some examples of the DNC AIS messages as well uh, as a, 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 an approved color scheme. Almost anyone could look at this and say, wow, that's high density bathymetry from multi beam sonar, gives us much better information of what the C4 looks like, and also more intuitive color scheme, but we'll get to that in a second. From this, we can now produce decimeter soundings, depth contours, or even better, depth areas in decimeter. That's basically, well, in the US, we're moving to metric inch by inch, so I, I know it's difficult for some of you to realize. Okay? On the other hand, given this information, we now have the ability to be able to say if this was in fact provided, if water level information was provided, either predicted or in real time at different locations, this now could be combined together to produce a so called dynamic ENC where ship safety contour is adjusted based upon the tidal height. This is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have about four meters of tide. This is a simulation using eight meters of tide, which we occasionally have, big nor'easter storms, but it tells you what is, not what was, yet in the future what will be. We have some limitations in terms of how e-navigation information in the foreseeable future will ever be displayed. Right now, we have the minimum keyboard display, affectionately known as the Mickey Mouse display. There's no effective way to display any type of information other than textual. And at current time, so those vessels are not required to have any way to display AIS application-specific messages. On the other hand, some systems are already doing this. So Mechus, again, as an ECS, integrated navigation systems, and most specifically, pilot units. Pilots are the early innovators of e-navigation. Their equipment is not constrained by minimum performance standard or carriage requirements. They do things because it's a good idea and because they feel they need to. Not surprisingly, other regions like the Baltic have looked at this and said, well, that makes sense. If you have a supplemental display in addition to what's required, why not have a short base display at a BTS center and an additional notebook computer or portable pilot unit looking type of system on board a vessel. And the Suda Serenade, one of the larger uh, ferries in the Baltic, has this to display supplemental e-navigation related information. There's some other challenges for harmonization as well. I don't see too many mariners, some in uniform, I don't see any cadets. All mariners can look at the right hand side and say, well that looks like a nautical chart. Deep water is shown as what color? This is a quiz. It's white, okay? Look at the orthogonal photograph, the aerial photograph of the left. What color is deep water? Which one is right? Trick question, they're both right. Now, this isn't a problem, but it does mean that there are perhaps improved ways to look at the display of navigation really information, particularly from high density bathymetry. Not surprisingly, there are some companies that have already implemented new and improved color schemes, whether it be a bathymetric pew, blue, or a red, yellow, green for what? Decision support. Go, no go. Safe, unsafe. Okay? Just like a traffic light scheme. Red for weight, yellow for caution, green for go. Again, we need to look at ways to harmonize this, particularly if most VTS centers already use this color scheme because they feel this is the best one in which to use. There are other options for displaying the supplemental information, AIS application-specific messages. <coughs> on the left are the various applications in a IMO circular called 289. And on the right, there are different display options for another circular, alphanumeric, graphical, symbol, or geospatial. And we have some pilots in Tampa Bay that are already using this from the NOAA physical oceanographic real-time system, which for most people is confusing when they call it ports, but nonetheless. But the pilots actively use this, and all we're concerned about is basically trends. But you can show the same information in other ways, which is done in the Galveston or Houston. Here you have time series graphs. You have predicted as well as real-time predicted in, in, in blue and real-time in red, 
and you have some graphic or, alpha, or, or uh, symbols shown on the lower right. These are all then types of information that are provided to be used in which to make informed decisions. We also have, in some areas, like in the St. Lawrence River in Canada, having to do with current flow. This river system has about anywhere from five to eight meters of tide. And when you see red arrows, that was over seven knots of current. Now, if you have all of this, great. If you're relying on it, even better. But what if? In my career, and I'm one of the older, more <clears throat> experienced persons here, I believe and trust in Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and usually at the absolute worst time. There are also other related laws, like Glib's laws of, of unreliability. Anyone thinks that a computer is going to be infallible has got a big mistake. Okay? Any system that depends on human reliability is inherently unreliable. And worse, undetectable errors are infinite variety in contrast to detectable errors, which by definition are limited. And there's the other belief that software can be written and, and used that, that is always reliable. Well, as it says there, there's only two ways to have error-free and only the third one actually works. As such, e-navigation, an important aspect is to ensure the quality of the software that is being used in the various systems. Everything in this case, from the water level sensor data that's converted into binary data, that is then converted into an AIS application-specific message broadcast from an AIS base station and used either by pilots, by mariners, or BTS or port, or port Authority. And this, in fact, then has to do with the trend in the, in the display of e-navigation information. This is where we are at present. And when it comes to chart-related information, there'll be less in the future, more specific to the task at hand, and a lot more operational. On the other hand, some caution. What you see is a 3D simulation that some would say, well, this is the chart of the future. I probably don't have enough time before I'm strangled or pulled off the podium, but this looks great, but there are three major flaws with what you are seeing here. Three major problems. I'm not going to tell you what they are, but it'll be interesting to see if some of you can pick on these. We will have a, a question and answer session, or you can come up with me afterwards. But there are some big problems with this future display. And yet, when congressmen or other non mariners look at this and they say, oh, this is the future, I'm here to tell you it's not necessarily. This is how I started out my career in the U.S. Navy. Most of you mariners would start it out the same way. Too many things, too often, oftentimes in conflict. This, this was the promise of electronic charts. I like to call this the minimum bare-ass display. What you need to know, when you need to know it. But what's the real advantage of ECTUS? It's not to be glued to the monitor. It's allowing more time to look out the window. It's a decision support tool. It is not virtual reality. It is not telling you everything you need to know. And in this regard, there are some major challenges related to what in pink are the desirable outcomes. Ensuring the availability of all components is going to be a challenge. Incorporating new technology into structure matter even a bigger challenge. Because if you integrate more components into a system, it often means increased complexity and less reliability. More information is not necessarily better. And just because some person tells you he thinks this is information you need, does not necessarily make it slow. And anytime you try to integrate new technologies with existing systems, it oftentimes of course, causes more problems than it solves. So in this regard, what is or should be the role and responsibility of government, particularly in the 
in the realization that there are two different groups involved, the providers and the users. Those who are providing necessary services and those who will actually use or rely on. And there's a dilemma. My colleague from Canada, Mike Casey, retired from Canadian Hydrographic Service, identified this. How can the government provide necessary services or resources to establish an infrastructure unless there's a commitment by the maritime industry to actually use and potentially even pay for it? Conversely, why would users commit to something until the government actually is willing to build the infrastructure and provide the necessary services? I'm not going to ask you, but which comes first? Okay, I just did. The realities then are e-navigation is an evolutionary process. It's not a revolutionary change. And when you change or cause change to try and true practices, it's often a bumpy ride. There are some significant implications that will be involved. Will this mean that there's e-navigation training, modes of operation, capable vessels? Will we have assurance like we did in GPS from intermediate operational capability to full operational capability for e-navigation? Hopefully, we'll get some insight today. In this regard, it's always good to look at an alternative point of view. And there was a particularly interesting op-ed written by Paul Kirshner in Pacific Maritime <coughs> called, uh, I believe, uh, have we run out of the channel or something like that. He recommends three things greater involvement by the shipping industry, refocus on the needs of the mariner, and that IMO and Ohio should abandon their central planning approach. Well, I'm not so sure the third one is realistic, but certainly the first two warrant some consideration. I believe Peter Phillips has already handed out a copy of this paper. So in the end, where do we start from? Where are we at? Where do we go from here? If, in fact, e-navigation is supposed to be user-driven, you can decide for yourself in the next two days if, in fact, this has actually occurred. In my view, we need to let the mariners decide. What are the requirements? And in some cases, that occur when the user needs study. What should be the navigation equipment systems and services? It can't be everything, and there has to be some realistic middle ground. And what are some of the major implementation issues? We need to look at limitations. We need to look at challenges and divert them into opportunities, and we need to commit to implementation. Ideally, again, our government colleagues will address some of these. And in the final slide, it always helps to think like a mariner if, in fact, it's the user that's going to be provided e-navigation services and the user who is actually Thank you very much.